All right, Mountain View. Good morning to you. I hope you are having a great, great Sunday on this brisk and cool fall morning. So great to be with you. You're wondering, Brandon, something looks so different about you. And to answer your question, what is it? Yes, I've been working out. And um, <laughs> so thanks for noticing. I appreciate you caring enough about me to, to see the significance of, of this moment. Uh, in 2018, Cigna Health and UCLA partnered on a nationwide research study that revealed that over half of Americans report that they feel lonely. The New York Times in 2022 released an article entitled, How Loneliness is Impacting Our Health. In this article, they uh, showed more research that said that in a city of 9 million people, 57% of New Yorkers report feeling lonely. Of that 57% of people in New York City who feel lonely, the largest portion of the lonely are from the youngest of generations. In the article, they cited some information from mental health professionals that says this, loneliness is defined by mental health professionals is the gap between the level of connectedness that you want and the level of connectedness that you have. Loneliness is not the same as social isolation, which is codified in the social sciences as a measure of a person's contacts. Loneliness is a subjective feeling. People can have a whole lot of contact and still feel lonely. What causes loneliness can be a variety of things. What, what we do in, in an attempt to mitigate the loneliness that we feel can also be a variety of things. And humanity has tried a myriad of different things just to try to get rid of this feeling of loneliness that we have. But the answer to loneliness, uh, the answer to the loneliness that maybe you have felt in your life, at some point in your life, the loneliness that we've all experienced at some point in our life is found in one place. And we're going to find that source today. So if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn over to John chapter 4. And uh, this is a moment in history, a moment in the life of Christ that Jesus is just now starting out his ministry He's three chapters in, if you will, to the, to the ministry and the leadership of the Messiah. And he's already accomplished and already done a whole lot up to this point, just four chapters in to the Gospel of John. Up to this point, Jesus has already been identified as the Messiah, the promised one, the one that everyone has been waiting on. Up to this point in chapter 4, Jesus has already begun to build out his team of disciples. He's performed miracles. He's addressed the dysfunction of the day. He's called out some of the unhealthy things in the religious leaders that are around him. And he's clarified for everyone around in this new style of teaching, he's clarified his brand new kingdom ethic. An ethic that's completely redefined what it looks like to live as someone of faith. Jesus has done a lot, and he's just in the first quarter, if you will, of his ministry. And as he's gaining steam, as he's growing in popularity, Jesus leaves for Galilee. And as he's on his way to Galilee, we pick up with the story of where Jesus is. In John chapter 4, Verse 4, and Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Now let's pause. Before we get into this, before we scramble a whole lot of eggs this morning and we're walking through the entire chapter of chapter 4, we got we to gotta pause here because Jesus, in order to get to Galilee, has to go through Samaria. Now you may just hear this as just another city in the Middle East. You may just kind of pass through this, but we've got to understand that for Jesus, for, for the Jews, this going through Samaria was passing through enemy territory. Jesus was going through hostile ground. 
But if you've read any stories about Jesus, if you've heard any stories about uh, this person named Jesus in the Gospels, you know that Jesus doesn't avoid messy people. Uh, We're going to see that very clearly today in our text as we uh, interact with Jesus and this woman at the well. But what we're also going to see is Jesus doesn't avoid going to hard places. Verse 5, so Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now notice, just for a minute with me, if you, if you can stick with me in the classroom, I promise you we'll get back to church. Uh, but notice all of the detail in the text here. Notice how far John goes to to lay out the scenery of what's going on in this story. Uh, This isn't just a once upon a time. Uh, This isn't just, hey, for the purpose of this illustration, Jesus went to the... No, no, this is an exact science of what exactly happened historically in this moment. And the details are important. It's not just oral tradition, the details of being at Jacob's well. Jacob was historically the patriarch of God's people. Literally, Jacob's name, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And Jacob's well was an actual place in history, but it's an actual place that you can visit still to this day. The text says that Jesus was tired and that he made it to the well at about the sixth hour, or about noontime, uh, in our words. Which, who in their right mind is going to the well to draw water at the hottest point in the day? Like, who mows their lawn in the hottest point of the day around here? Right? Who goes on a run? I could just ask that question, who goes on a run? But who goes on a run at the hottest point in the day Well, some people do. These are all important details here. Verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, uh, Jesus and this woman are entering into this really casual conversation. They're, they're meeting at a very common place uh, that people would generally meet at. But they're going in the heat of the day. Let me just tell you, nobody was doing this in that day. Uh, they didn't have cute little umbrellas placed up like they do for the in and out workers who are living on God's mission and, and they've embraced God's call on their life. They don't have these umbrellas to shade the well and protect the area from the, the sun beating down on them. What people would do is they would go early in the morning while it was still cool so that they could draw well water then. But Jesus shows up and Ironically enough, somebody else shows up in the heat of the day. Uh, But this somebody else is uh, someone who has a reputation. Just spoiler alert, uh, this lady who comes to the well with Jesus, she's got a reputation. Uh, There's a bit of gossip going around town. And and so uh, this lady shows up at the well because she doesn't want the, uh, the well of Jacob to turn into the the water cooler of the office break room. She doesn't want to show up at a time when the rest of the women in the community have shown up and are are drawing well. She doesn't want to get any of the drama from these other ladies. And so she goes in the heat of the day when the sun is at the highest place to draw water then so that she doesn't have to see anybody else. But as she shows up, Hoping not to run into anyone else, she runs in to Jesus, and Jesus strikes up this casual conversation. And as as he strikes this casual conversation, she immediately flips the script. Did you notice that as soon as she engages with Jesus, she's like, whoa, what are you doing? Hey, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. 
Don't you know the history here? Don't you know the, the cultural divide? Don't you know the, the racism that's all over our two people groups? Don't you know that there's hostility? We don't even talk to each other. What are you doing? We, we're supposed to despise each other. And yet Jesus speaks to this woman. Jesus goes to this place, this place that others wouldn't go. He talks to people that other people wouldn't be caught dead talking to. Remember the, the cultural context here. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. And as a Jewish rabbi, religious leaders wouldn't talk to women. So if you were a man, if you were a rabbi, uh, you wouldn't have a conversation with a woman, much less a woman at noon with a reputation who's a Samaritan. And what we see immediately with, with just the, the surface of this text is we see that Jesus is breaking through all kinds of barriers, which tells you and tells me that Jesus' invitation reaches across cultural and religious barriers. Jesus in this moment cares more about this woman. Jesus cares more about her value than he does what was culturally acceptable of the day. Jesus sees her not for the wrong that she's done, uh, not for the position that she's in, but Jesus sees her and just breaks through all of that and has a conversation. If you read the Gospels, all throughout the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see that Jesus has a habit of elevating women, uh, of empowering women and speaking value over their life. And this is a big deal in our day, but this is also a big deal in Jesus' day because in that day, in that century, in that culture, women were just viewed as, as property. And so in this moment, right from the start, Jesus breaks through the racial barriers, uh, the historically acceptable barriers, the cultural barriers to speak to this woman and speak value over her life. What does this mean for us? It means that for followers of Jesus, we're not asking questions like, hey, what does culture say is acceptable for us? We're not even asking questions in our life of what does Christian culture say is acceptable for us? We've got to ask the question, what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus inviting us to do? And all throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus loves people more than anything. He loves people uh, more than he cares about what people think about him. He loves people more than the expectations that people put on him. He loves people more than the expectations that the religious leaders had for him. Jesus loved people and spoke value into people because he cared deeply for people. We're going to see that time and time again throughout this conversation that Jesus has with this woman. This is actually the longest conversation that we have recorded all throughout the Gospels. Back to the text, verse 10. Right after uh, the Samaritan woman has pushed back to say, what are you doing talking to me? Jesus answers this way. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, we're going to come back to this phrase, uh, living water. Uh, but let's keep going. Verse 11, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. <laughs> this is funny to me because Jesus has showed up. He's tired. He's thirsty. He needs water. He kind of flips the script to talk about living water. And she's like, hey, um, I don't know how else to say this. You don't even have anything to get water with. Where do you get this living water, she asks. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus responds to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I'll never be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. I'll have what he's having. 
Verse 16, Jesus says to her, go and call your husband and come here. Now, this is the point when things get maybe a little bit awkward. Things get very real and authentic in this moment. Hey, hey go, have your, uh, go and call your husband. Have him come over. Verse 17, the woman answered to him, I, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you have five husbands. You've had five husbands. And the one that you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. Now, in this conversation that got very real and very authentic uh, for, for this woman talking to Jesus, Jesus brings up this whole brand new idea of living water. Uh, what she probably didn't know, what she uh, later probably found out was that Jesus is referring back to the prophet Jeremiah when Jeremiah in, in chapter 2, verse 13, says this about the living water. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So while Jesus in this moment is just breaking through cultural barriers, while he is shattering the expectation of the spiritual elite in this moment, religiously, racially, he says to this woman, I've got for you living water. And then he brings up these relational issues in her life. And he says, you've been looking for love in all the wrong places. But Jesus says, I've got water for you. I've got love for you that is so deep and so authentic that it is going to well up from within you, from inside you, to the extent that you will never again thirst for love. And here's what we need to know. For you and for me, just like for this woman, Jesus invites us to true soul satisfaction. Jesus answers the questions of our life. Jesus brings the satisfaction that we're so desperate for in our life. And what Jesus offers satisfaction in is not a broken cistern. It's not a fake hope. It's not some religious rabbit's foot. It is not an empty pinata that when you get to the core of it, you found out that it was just nothing to begin with. No, this is a spring, Jesus says, that wells up. Do you know the difference between well water and spring water? Uh, I mean, I'm just asking. I, I don't know. No. <laughs> Now, do you know the difference between well water and spring water? Well water, you've got you've to dig for. You've got you've to go deep for. You've got to spend time drilling down into planet Earth in order to get down to well water. You've you got to build out some things around it. You've you got to have some systems and some pulleys. and You've got to prepare ahead of time if you want some well water because you've got to bring a bucket or you've got to bring a jug of some sort. Uh, there's some work that's involved. There's some planning that's involved with well water. Uh, our family, we've got, a, we've got a farm in Tennessee, and we have a spring running through the farm. And you know the beauty of having a spring? You just show up, and you just drink. You don't have to come prepared for anything. You, you, just, you just go to the spring and drink from it. And Jesus is saying in this moment to, to this woman, I'm offering you living water in the person of me. And you, in this moment, if you, if you drink this living water, you can stop looking everywhere else for everything you're looking for. You can stop looking for love in all the wrong places because love will reside inside you now. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus in the room today, uh, you, may, uh, you may have put your faith and trust in Jesus. And you may hear a story like this and say, yes, I've trusted in the living water, but Brandon, why do I still thirst? Uh, why do I still look? Why do I still search? To answer your question, you do because you're, you're digging. You're still digging in broken wells. We do this all the time. Even as followers of Jesus, we're, we try to build wells in ones that we can't build because they're in the past. 
and they're not in the present. Listen, you cannot go back and redo the past. You can only redo the present. Maybe I need to say it again. You cannot go back and change and redo the past, but God can redeem your present. Whatever your past has been, whatever your past was, whatever story was written then, God can redeem because of the blood of Jesus now. God can redeem your present today. But we thirst, we search, we, we look, we, we pursue so many different things because we're trying to build wells that are broken. We do it all the time. We try to rebuild wells after disappointment. And if Jesus is right, and, and I believe he is, because when someone raises from the dead, you kind of take them at their word. Uh, Jesus does something interesting here. He connects our soul's longing and our, and our thirst to worship, because the reality is every one of us are worshipers. We all worship something. We all worship someone. And Jesus, what's interesting here, he ties our thirst to worship. And what the Bible teaches is that if we worship anything other than the one and true and living God, then we are worshiping an idol. Maybe you're quick to say, well, well Brandon, uh, okay, keep moving on, keep, keep working through the text because I don't, I don't worship any idols. And, 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 and you're probably thinking, well, I don't have anything built in my house that like I, I put smoke and candles around and I don't bow down to any carved out images or anything like that. And I'm not like sacrificing animals to anything in my house. And you're right. But at the same time, we have idols. For some of us, it's our job. And we look to our job to bring the soul satisfaction in our life that we're longing for and searching for and looking for. And uh, we just put everything out on the table. We, we sacrifice so much because we think that if we can get to this place in our job, in our career, then our soul will somehow, some way, be satisfied. We think that if we can get to this position, if we can get to this place, but the problem is whenever you worship an idol, number one, you're enslaved to it, and number two, you will be disappointed by it. And so if you worship your, your job, you'll, you'll end up being enslaved to it. You won't have your job. Your job will have you. And you'll sacrifice time with your spouse. You'll sacrifice time with your, your kids. You'll sacrifice anything and everything just to get that corner office. And when you get it, you will realize that it is the idol that it was, that it's enslaved you, and that it'll eventually disappoint you because it does not bring the satisfaction that the living water can bring. And one day you'll get it and be shocked that it's just disappointing. It didn't redeem your life. It didn't satisfy your soul, but you got the corner office. Because when you worship the idol of your job or, or your career, it will enslave you and it will disappoint you. Maybe for you, it's not your job. You're like, I oh, no, I could leave that yesterday. Maybe for you, it's the relationships in your life. The relationship that you so long for and have looked for that has never come to fruition has become an idol. Maybe the relationships that are in your life that you have, that, that have come to fruition, you've just looked to, to complete you. And so what you end up doing in those relationships is you put the pressure on them and wonder why they're not satisfying you like you want. And here's why, because relationships, uh, you're supposed to love people, not worship people. You're supposed to love them as a human being, not put your hope in them. You're supposed to partner with them, not worship them. For some of you, it's the relationship with your kids. That's become your idol in your life. And kids do silly things. Do you know why? Because they're kids. But we get all wrapped around the axle because we think everything that our kids do is a reflection of us. And so we start to worship our kids and how our kids turn out and what our kids accomplish and uh, what our kids can achieve and 
When your expectation with your kids aren't met, it all comes crumbling down before you and this little idol starts to die. But we got to understand that kids are going to do silly things. Hello, because they are kids. You did silly things. I did silly things. We can't put our hope and all of our stock in our kids to complete us. Because Jesus says, I've got everything that you need to complete you. I've got living water for you. I've got real hope. And you can love God. You can worship God. And he will complete you because this is what you were created for. Friends, family, listen to me. Stop digging broken wells. Stop wasting your time pursuing everything else because Jesus has said it right here, clearly in the text, I am the living water. Everything in your soul and everything that your soul longs for is found in Jesus. And when you look other places, it's just like splashing water on your face, expecting that to quench your thirst. But Jesus invites us to true life. The story goes on and uh, verse 25 is... Jesus and this woman at the well are continuing their conversation. This is how it goes in verse 25. The woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who's called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. This, this woman has heard that there's a Messiah coming. She knows enough to even call him Christ. And let me just clarify any confusion. This is not Jesus' last name. It's not like uh, Mary and Joseph Christ were married and then they had their baby Jesus Christ and he just became, no, was, this was uh, the anointed one, the chosen one, the redeemer. Story goes on in verse 26. Jesus said to her, I, will, I who speak to you am he. Just then Jesus' disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. No one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, verse 29, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? These simple words, come and see, are so powerful because you never know what God might do through a simple invitation. Uh, the invitation uh, wasn't come and die. It wasn't overwhelming like sell everything that you have. The invitation of Jesus wasn't memorize scripture and clean up your life. No, this invitation wasn't even a threatening invitation. Come and convert. Show up and shut up. Turn or burn. This woman had never been to seminary. She doesn't have a Bible degree. She just met Jesus at the well. And then she goes back to her city and says, come and see a man who could be the one who could change everything. The invitation is simple. The invitation from Jesus is simply come and see. And watch what happens by this simple, simple invitation. In verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. This woman who now we know is a woman with history, a woman with a reputation, became the very first evangelist and many people from her town believed in Jesus. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there for two days, and many more believed because of his word. You never know, you never know what God might do through a simple invitation. This woman probably hadn't even darkened the doors of a church. This woman was in deep sexual and immoral sin. She was completely broken, and she knew it. This woman was so ashamed of her brokenness that she did everything she could to avoid everyone she could just so that she wouldn't have to deal with this brokenness. She had tried everything that she could, five husbands deep, and none of them, none of them could satisfy. She had nowhere to go. 
She had no one who really loved her, who really satisfied, who really knew her and chose her anyway. But Jesus walks into the middle of her life. He comes into the middle of her city, into her rhythm, into her brokenness, into her mess, and changed her life, just like Jesus can change yours. Just like he can change the life of that friend that you have who's searching in all the wrong places. Jesus wasn't afraid of her mess. Jesus didn't avoid her mess. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Even his disciples questioned him, why are you talking to this woman? Jesus knew the cultural and the historical and the relational implications, the the racial even implications of having a conversation with her and allowing her to be in his presence. Yet because he loved her, he sat with her and he changed her life. For Christ followers, for us as Christians, we ought to be the people that will sit with anyone to point them to Jesus. We ought to be the church that says anyone can come and see that Jesus can change everything. I just wonder as we walk through this text, I wonder if there's anyone on your so-called list that you wouldn't sit with. If you've, if you've ever had kids, you know as you're talking with your loved ones about what you're going to name your child, There's always that like hidden list of, oh, we can't name them that because I knew somebody in high school who (laughs) was crazy. We like, there's just that. So like we have in our minds an emotional and mental list of people that, yeah, we'll we'll hang out with just about anyone. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, fill in the blank on this sentence. Fill in the blank. Blank is made in the image and likeness of God. Did you know there's not a single person? There's not a single people group that you could put in there that would make that sentence untrue. But yet in our daily life, there, there are moments that we just kind of push back and say, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to associate with that person. Maybe it's political. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's historical that, hey, we don't, we don't associate with those type of people. But yet Jesus walked right into her mess. Who in your life are you avoiding that Jesus has said to be pursuing? Who in your life are you uh, stepping back from when Jesus is inviting you to step toward so that they too can come and see that Jesus changes everything? You never know what God could do through a simple invitation.